Hey, hello everyone. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I record every one of my lectures and I put them online for my students to have a good resource for review. And also I hope it helps working professionals. And I don't have to just hope. I get a lot of good feedback from folks working in a variety of different professional settings who tell me that they're making some use out of this content. So I'm really happy about that. I'm just really super stoked about it. So let's get into our next discussion. Now this is all part of the machine learning course. We have covered a lot of feature engineering, fundamental probability and statistics, subsurfing, subsurface modeling strategies, all kinds of topics. Now let's, we're into inferential statistical machine learning types of approaches. Let's now discuss in the manner of dimensionality reduction, the specific example of principal component analysis. So we'll cover that. In the previous lecture, we talked about kernel-based me methods for nonlinear. We talked about the idea of factor analysis and so forth, just as a very brief summary for kind of providing some context. Now let's get into principal component analysis. Okay. So what do we do in principal component analysis? It's an orthogonal transformation of predictor features. We're going to convert our set of predictor features into a set of linearly uncorrelated features known as principal components. The number of principal components P that we can actually create is going to be either the minimum of n minus 1 or m. In other words, if we have lots of data, we do have access to p equals to m. We can actually have p principal components equal to the dimensionality of the original data set. But if we have a data set with few data, n, the number of samples is small, it makes sense that we cannot create a representation in a dimensionality any greater than n minus 1. And that makes sense. Let's think about this really quickly. If I have two data, I can describe a line, but I cannot describe a unique plane. If I have three data, I can describe a unique plane, but I cannot describe a three-dimensional space. So it's this old issue here. So in most of our settings, our number of data is going to be greater than the number of features, so we won't be limited. We'll be able to have P principal components. The components are ordered, and this is super interesting. The first component describes the largest the largest amount of variance and accounts for as much as the variability in the data set in that multidimensional space as possible. The next component describes the largest possible remaining part of the variance under the constraint of orthogonality, as we mentioned before, to the first principal component. We will continue order the most important to the next, to the next, to the next important, right to the last principal component describes the least amount of variability in its orthogonality. It'll be constrained by the orthogonality constraint with all of the other principal components. How do we calculate principal components? First, we have to standardize the features. Remember, this is an analysis that's going to be sensitive to the variance of each one of our features. You could imagine if we were dealing with a data set, we had permeabilities going from zero to a thousand millidarcies versus we have a data set where we're going from 0 0.001 to one darcies. We would have a dramatic impact on the variance. We know from expectation, if we change by three orders of magnitude in scale, we're effectively changing the variance by that squared so a million change in the variance. And so this would dramatically impact the result of principal component analysis. We want to remove that sensitivity to the actual units. We want to remove the sensitivity to the fact that we happen to measure acoustic impedance in a totally different set of numbers or ranges than we do porosity, which won't just be fractional. Otherwise, features with large variances or the nuance of exactly what unit you use will just have such a huge impact on the analysis. Let's standardize first. We're going to go ahead and calculate the standardized feature covariance matrix. Not a big deal. We talked about this in statistics. We, I have um, lectures on bivariate statistics if you're interested. Super easy to look this up on Wikipedia. The covariance. What is the covariance? 
It's a non-standardized correlation coefficient. But what's fascinating is we already did a standardization to force the variance to be equal to one. If you've done that, we're in a situation where you could actually be working with the correlation matrix. Correlations are nice. They're very intuitive. They go from, ne from negative one to one. They're quite interpretable. Okay, so now let's go ahead. We've got the standardized feature covariance matrix. What's the next step? We got to calculate the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So now at any point, if you're finding that you feel like you're um, kind of lacking the prerequisites for machine learning in linear algebra, I very strongly recommend this video series, this lecture series by three blue, one brown, which deals with many of the different aspects of linear algebra in a beautiful, beautiful graphical manner. I've got to tell you, their lecture on determinants, where were you back when I was an undergrad student struggling with this? Okay, so we're going to solve for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So an eigenvector is a vector whose direction remains unchanged when a linear transform is applied to it. How do we solve for it? We use this relationship right here where we have C is our covariance matrix. We want to solve for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the C matrix. We want to solve for the eigenvectors, which is V right here, and the lambda, which is the eigenvalue right here. And we can solve for all the possible eigenvalues, eigenvectors, now which will be M available to us. So what are we dealing with? We've got an M by M matrix for our covariance matrix. That makes sense. We've got an M by one matrix of the eigenvector and the lambda is just a scalar. Now we can reorder this right here as shown here, just using very elementary operators in, in linear algebra. And then by Kramer's rule, we know that we'll have a solution to the system if the determinant of this component right here is equal to zero. We put the vertical bars to indicate the determinant of this is equal to zero. So we can put that together, solve for the determinant equals zero. And when we do that, we'll get the possible eigenvalues. Then we can go ahead and substitute that back in, get the eigenvectors associated with each one of those eigenvalues. This is super powerful because we're then able to solve for our principal components. Let's see how. The eigenvalues are the variance explained for each one of the components. The eigenvectors of the data covariance matrix, matrix are the principal components. Now, so what are they? Like, how would we interpret them? Well, if we look, imagine an example where we have data in some higher dimensional space and we were to construct the first, the very first eigenvector, this would be a representation right here. And what would it be? It, it would be a line in M dimensions that best describes the data from the perspective that when you project the data onto that line, that M dimensional data onto the line, it would describe the most amount of variance in the data set. And then if you took principal component one and two, you would now have a plane that would best describe the data from the perspective that it would describe as much of the variance when we project the data onto that plane as possible. So that's pretty cool. This is this would form a very good model to describe this data set in one dimension or in two dimension. The best description we could come up for that data from the standpoint of description of the variance. Now, so what we could write this out mathematically. This there's no mystery here. The xi we're talking about each one of the specific principal components that we're working with, the ones that we want to work with, and we have the mean. We've centered. We have to center when we work with principal components. We've also probably done a standardization. Now this component right here is the matrix with all of the principal component, um, principal component loadings, which we'll talk about right away, which in other words, is just an array with all of the eigenvectors. And we're applying it to the center data set. That gives us the principal component scores projected into a lower dimensional space. And then by applying it again, and you'll see that we can do that, we're actually getting the estimates back from the principal component scores back to the regular space. So this square difference right here is simply the difference between the projections into this, these principal components versus the original data. 
And so we, in fact, in maximizing the variance described within this plane, we're minimizing the variance of what we have not explained. And so that's very, very cool. We're minimizing the variance of the mismatch. And so that's very powerful. This is minimizing the orthogonal offset, or we could also think of it as a multidimensional error term. Okay, so we'll, we'll give many more details. That's just one interpretation we can use. It's a re, there's a relationship between um, principal components and eigenmath. We just mentioned this, eigenvectors of the data covariance matrix are the principal components and eigenvalues are the variance explained. So that's what we just showed. Now, there are some assumptions we should cover. We have a large enough sample set for reliable correlation calculation. We talked about bivariate statistics before in some of my other units, and we know that outliers are a big deal, that we need to have enough data so we can actually see the relationships. Some may suggest that we need at least five times the number of features to really understand the pairwise covariances between all of the data, and that we'd need some minimal number of data, say, 100 to 150 overall. There is also, we assume that there is correlation between the features. If you're trying to do principal component analysis and all the features are truly independent of each other, then what we're probably picking up on are just random correlations that appear within the data structures. You can run that experiment, just use a set of data, go ahead and calculate the covariance matrix or correlation matrix and you will see some degree of correlations that happen just by random. You could test for those, but we gotta be careful. Outliers are addressed. The covariance is very sensitive to outliers, and so this will have a dramatic impact. The other thing, and I wanna recognize that I grabbed this from a really nice article from Nature.com, where they described some of the assumptions associated with principal components. It will not perform well if you have nonlinear patterns in the M-dimensional space it's actually not able to pick up or describe them. What would be the principal components in this example right here? You can't figure it out. If you have non-orthogonal patterns, that's interesting. If we have specific patterns that are not orthogonal to each other, that would be very difficult to try to pick out or explore principal components. And if you had obscure patterns like this, Nah, there's, it doesn't, it would not work very well. The goal is to maximize the variance on each one of the projections. You really can't come up with one there that'll do a good job of doing that. Okay, so let's go ahead. I've taken from that same article some examples of principal components in 2D. I think this is a really nice example right here. We've got original data with feature X and Y, and we've got the data, training data samples are shown right here. Now, if you were to project that data on X and Y, you would find that, well, as expected, it must have been standardized because the variance of the projection in X and Y are both one. Now, if you were to actually come up with a new orientation U, project the data on U, and that's exactly what this is right here, the variance of the data projected into that vector is 1.78 you have described much more to the variance in a single feature. That's powerful. You see what we've done there? That's dimensionality reduction using principal components. We could retain just that one feature, describe this data set, and we would have captured 1.78 variance out of the total variance observed in both dimensions of 2.0. Now, if we look in the other orthogonal direction, because remember principal components, we are constrained by orthogonality. And so in 2D, once we calculate that one principal component, the other one is actually given to us by orthogonality. It has the remainder of the variance, the 0.22 described. And so that has very little information compared to U. V has very little information. Now, another way to think about this is it in fact is a rotation. We have taken the original X and Y, and we have rotated it to an orientation that describes as much variance as possible. So we can think of it as a rotation. And we'll show you it is an orthogonal transformation. It is a rotation. Okay, so it's a fitting, it really is like fitting an M-dimensional ellipsoid to the data. The length of each one of the axes indicates the amount of variance described by that component. And so we could draw it like this right here. The vast majority of the variance is described in this direction right here. We could represent that by the eigenvalue. In fact, 
and the eigenvalue in this direction, telling us that we describe very little variance here. Omitting an axis associated with principal component from our representation of the data set, we'd lose the information proportional to the length of that axis. If we were to retain only one and project our one principal component and, and project our data onto you alone, we would lose that 0.22 proportional to the length of that radius right there on our ellipsoid. So that's another interpretation we can use. Let me give a couple of um, more details here that can be helpful. The first principal component of a set of features, and so we have lowercase here, we're talking about the actual data values themselves. We got i with um, i representing the samples from one to n data samples that are available to us. And we're working with features one through m features. The first principal component of this set of features is the normalized linear combination of the features with the largest variance described. So in matrix notation, how would we communicate this? We have our original center data matrix, likely also standardized. We're going to solve for component loadings. Those are the linear weights that are going to be applied to each one of the features, resulting in brand new principal component scores. We're transforming the data. We're applying this linear transformation. Now, I should mention there's a normalization that's required over the features. That is the square of these loadings over the features, if we sum them up, is equal to zero. As a result, this transformation, in fact, is a rotation. So this is pretty cool now. So we have this original centered data matrix. We're going to calculate as our eigenvectors these principal component loadings under this normalization constraint, a rotation, and the result is we're going to get principal component scores, the projection of our data into this new rotated framework. And so the values of V are going to include all of our component loadings. Now we can calculate the first principal component score, project our values into this principal coordinate by using the following calculation. We're simply going to take each one of the original center data values or standardized data values and apply them to the principal component loadings all the way through M features. And the result is we're going to get our data as a principal component score for the very first principal component. Now we can go ahead and repeat that for all possible principal components. Principal component 1, 2, through M, as long as we meet the constraint of having enough data. We have to ensure that N minus 1 is greater than M, and then we're able to do this for all of the feature dimensions or all the features that are available for us. So we can look at, we'll have first principal component. We can calculate it. We can go ahead and calculate second principal component. We can go ahead and calculate all the way up to M. Now, we may be able to describe each principal component. This is interesting, in fact. We may find when we look at principal component one that the combination of features that are feeding into this component of the variance are all related to each other. For instance, they may in fact be heterogeneity components of the reservoir. We're trying to make a prediction in production. Then we may notice that principal component number two, that is orthogonal in, from, from the first principal component, is now describing the components the components of the variance related to completion information this is very powerful people often do this analysis on the principal components themselves so that's another nice thing you can do okay so how do we accomplish dimensionality reduction because so far all we've done is we converted our data from an original standardized centered x n by m matrix into principal component scores n by m. No dimensionality reduction yet. Now, but if we retain all the m components, then we have not achieved dimensional reduction. In fact, we just have orthogonal linear combination of original features. And in fact, we're a little bit worse off in fact, because these principal component scores, principal components, lose their physical meaning, as I mentioned before. They're going to be combinations of features that used to have physical meaning. So we haven't really gotten ahead. We may have, in fact, fallen a little bit behind. We gain dimensionality reduction by retaining only P principal components, or in other words, dropping the M minus P components as they describe very little of the variance.
Now the back transformation is really interesting. We can go ahead and take our principal components and we can just simply take the inverse of the V matrix and apply it to our principal components and we'll get a projection of or an estimate of our original data, our original centered data or standardized data. Now what's really cool is since the V matrix it's orthonormal and so because of that in matrix algebra or matrix matrix math we know that the inverse of the matrix is just equal to the transform now this is super cool we just simply take the principal component loadings apply them to the centered original data and we get the principal components we can take the principal components and simply apply the transform of those principal component loadings and we get the projection and so if we think about it we're just simply applying it again we're taking those those weights those linear weights and applying it to the principal components so we take our principal component scores and we're just going to simply once again apply these loadings to them and the result is we get the estimate all we have to do is just stop short and so when we sum k equals 1 to m just stop at p don't add it in don't add in M minus P components, drop them off. Effectively, it's like we're zeroing out the principal component loadings associated with the M minus P components. Ah, this is super cool. So it's very easy to go back and forth. And so what did we accomplish? A graphical representation of this idea of dimensionality reduction is this. We have an original data set in two dimension. Here's the link right here to where I've taken this image. Thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and have the original sample data right here. We calculate the first principal component, which is represented by this line right here. We have a two-dimensional problem, first principal component. We can see it as just a line right here. If we were to go ahead and approximate the data with only the first principal component, it is like, it is like or it actually is, us projecting the data, orthogonal projection onto the first principal component. That's the purple points right there. Now we perform our analysis with the purple points. Now what's super cool is we have our first principal component right here. The principal component score for the first principal component is a dial that allows us to scan along this line numbers going from low to high that first principal component score is scanning that data space in a very efficient manner that's super cool okay let's give a couple more details right here the forward transformation to get our our principal component scores we're going to simply take an x matrix as we showed before it is an n by m matrix the data samples the data features we're going to take the principal component loadings, which is going to be an M by M matrix, but we will decide to truncate it to P, retaining the first P principal components. If we apply this, we do this matrix math, we have an N by M times, a, times an M by P. The result is we're going to get an N by P set of principal component scores. And so it'll be for our first P principal components, we'll have the data projected into that space. Now what's very cool, we can make a couple more comments about that. We're gonna normalize by feature to ensure that the variance of each one of the features is equal to one. We're gonna go ahead and constrain it such that we ensure that it's orthogonal, such that the sum of the squares of the component loadings is equal to one. It's now a rotation. And when we look at the variance associated, if we go over the samples 1 through M for each one of the principal components 1 through P, we can see the amount of variance described in each one of these columns. We could produce a scree plot, which is simply the variance within each one of these principal components versus the component number 1 through M, or we could stop at P, and we'll find it'll go like this. It will decrease because we're guaranteed that the amount of variance described is maximized in the first principal component and for the second principal component under the constraint of orthogonality to that first principal component. So it will go from highest variance described to least variance described in the principal component scores. That's super powerful stuff. The reverse transformation is super easy because remember, because of orthogonality, we can apply the transform of the component loadings instead of actually having to work out the inverse. Hooray!
That's super easy to do. And so we can take the principal component scores, one through P. We've got our sample data going from one to M. So we transform our data into that lower dimensional space. We can apply it to the component loadings, P by M. And the result is we'll be back in our normalized, standardized data space. We've got N by M with all of our original samples, one through N, and we've got all of our original features. We're back in those great features there, but notice this is an estimate because we had a, we projected to a lower dimensional space. We have lost some of the variance and we could go ahead and remove the normalization, reverse the standardization, and we could get back to the original feature space and we could do math and we can work with those features in that space. Now, what are the typical workflows people use for principal component analysis? I hope this figure helps you. We have the original data representing one through M features. We do principal component analysis and we retain P principal components. Now we can look at the principal components themselves. We can visualize, analyze those principal components. People in the banking industry do that. It's super interesting because you can look at the independent components for each principal component that's describing the most amount of variance. And what you'll find out is that there's variable groupings. Certain features or variables are going to have more impact on certain principal components. And so you can see how the variance can be broken up into different components. And you might see there's natural types of phenomenon there. As I mentioned before, heterogeneity versus completions and so forth. In banking, they'll be able to look at different stocks. I'll show an image and see how maybe things are related to different aspects of our economy. Well, we'll probably more often than not take those principal component loadings, apply them to the original data and get principal component scores. Now we can go ahead and visualize the data, analyze the data in this reduced dimensionality space. In fact, if you were to do PCA linear regression, you can do linear regression on the principal component scores. You can do that in that space. We can do all kinds of great math in that lower dimensional space. We can avoid overfit and so forth. Now, we then can do some statistical inference and modeling. As I mentioned before, we could take those principal component scores. This is where we get the job done. We do some modeling. Then when we're done with the modeling, I, if I've made predictions using principal component linear regression for a result like permeability, well, I need to transform everything back. I need to get back into original feature space because I need to actually make predictions in the original features. And so we can go ahead and do the reverse transformation, get everything back to the original space where the physics makes sense. Okay, so that's what we do. That's the typical workflows that we can use for principal components. Uh, here's an example in R. I have to admit, I like R a lot. I love the way we can visualize and do things in R. So this example's in R. Don't worry, my examples for the class, hands-on exercises are all in Python. Um, I know we've been doing Python in class. We've got a data set right here. We've got a thousand wells with permeability, per, um, porosity, acoustic impedance, brittleness, total organic carbon, and so forth. The files here, here's the seven lines of, from the file, a preview like a head command where we're looking at the first six samples. This data set is available on my GitHub account for anybody else who's not in my class, not a, with no access to Canvas. It's on my GitHub account under GeoDatasets repository. We can go ahead and do a matrix scatter plot, look at the relationships between the data, lots of interesting features, some nonlinearity, kind of complicated. Now for this example, I'm going to project down or marginalize down to just two features. So we're going to go ahead and just look at two features at a time. And we have log permeability versus porosity. Nice linear relationship, really well behaved, looks pretty good. Now we can go ahead and see if there's an opportunity for us to try to do principal components to reduce dimensionality from two dimensions, two features to one. We go ahead and calculate the principal component loadings and we get a matrix like this. Pretty straightforward. It provides on the columns principal component one and two. And then for each one of the variables or features, poor and log permeability, we have the individual loadings. We can see them right there. So we can calculate principal component scores as follows. Principal component score number one, just take principal component loading associated with porosity for principal component one, 
right here, apply it to the standardized or centered porosity value at sample number one, take the principal component loading for log permeability associated with principal component one right here, and apply it to the centered log permeability for data sample number one. That gets us principal component score for sample number one for principal component number one. And you can repeat that for all of the I through N data samples and all the one, the one through M features that are available to us. And that will, from that, we've now mapped our data into principal component scores. Let's look at it. Let's see what that looks like. We got our original data shown right here. We got log permeability versus porosity. And that, that was it originally. Now this is principal component score number one, principal component score number two. Look at what happened. Look really carefully. You see these two points? See the two points there? See these three points, these three points here? All we've done is a rotation and there was a standardization. So things have spread out a little bit, but that's all we've done. And so now we have principal component number one and two. Now here's a question. What would we lose if we were to go ahead and use just one principal component, reduce the dimensionality down to one? We've got principal component one and two. We go ahead and calculate principal component scores for principal component one and two, plot them. We zero out principal component number two. We're zeroing out its loadings, or we could effectively just remove it from that previous summation that I showed before in order to do the transformation. So now we go ahead and we've got our data set represented in only principal component number one. Principal component number two is just zeroed out. I could have put it on a one dimensional plot. Then we inverse the PCA principal components by simply applying the transform of the component loadings to this data set. We've zeroed out the second loading. We don't have to use that. And now this is the data representation right here. We went from here to here. We describe the most amount of variance in one dimension like this. And the result in porosity permeability, we're able to now do modeling. We can work with that. We have, in fact, what's really cool is we can use that principal component score and we can actually scan through the data in using just one value, one dial. That's pretty powerful right there. Now, biplots are often used. This is not an interesting biplot right here. They're more interesting when they're high dimensional problems are being shown. But what we usually do with a biplot is we show the principal component score one, principal component score number two, and then at the same time we plot the loadings for porosity permeability. And what you can see from that is you'll see if we had a bunch of features and you saw a bunch of them clumped up together and working in the same direction, it would tell you, oh, in principal component number one, we're mostly dominated by these features that have lines that are going in that direction. And then maybe we have a bunch going this direction and we'd say, oh, principal component number two is dominated by these features. This is very powerful. In this plot right here, it's a little bit kind of trivial since it's only two dimensional. Now scaling, what if we had not performed a standardization on the data? So if we had not done that, so if we had not done scaling, this is what the data would look like we would have saw that the vast majority of the variability is described by porosity and that in fact, very little of the variability is described by the log permeability. And that would just be due to the nature of the difference in the values. Look at this, log permeability going from zero to three, porosity going from eight to 22. And so it would, porosity would dominate the first principal components, the loadings for porosity would be huge. Permeability would be relegated just to the second principal component with very little bit of the variance described. Now we could go ahead, going back to our standardized state, we can calculate the amount of variance described by just simply looking at for each one of the principal component scores, we can just calculate they're centered already. So we can go ahead and just take the sum of the squares of the values over the data one through N, and we'll get the variance described for each one of them. So if we do that, what we'll find is 89%, 90% of the variance is described by the first principal component and 10% of the variance described by the second. And if we look at the, going back to these drawings right here, this is describing 90% of the combined variance. Uh, so that's really cool stuff. So this is what we call a scree plot. Once again, not super interesting when we're only working with 
two features, but we, we worked with two features for this example. It'd be super easy to visualize and understand what's going on. Okay, let me touch on this because I mentioned it, but I want to do a better job of it. Job of it. What can we do with principal component analysis? Well, first, I showed the workflow where we were simply interpreting and starting to understand what's going on. We can look at the loadings, but another thing we can do is we can work in this lower dimensional space and do things like make predictions. So we can go ahead. Multilinear regression would say take your n by m matrix of all of your features and all of your samples, apply linear regression to it, and you can make predictions of y. Uh, and that's pretty powerful stuff, right? Principal component regression, what it would do is you would do your principal component analysis, get a reduced dimensionality representation, go ahead and do multilinear regression on that, and then you would get yourself predictions such that you are, you've reduced issues around multicollinearity, so you may have a re improved model with improved stability. Now, also we can do inference. We can go ahead and try to understand our variables, understand how our variance is partitioned across the different features that we're working with. That's fine. We can check for and mitigate for multicollinearity. You know, if we remove principal components with very low variances, those are, those are principal components that we're describing very little of the variance contribution. And so we'll get rid of those redundancies. Now, PCA with, PCA with images. I think this example, and this example is taken directly out of the Hasty and All book, wonderful book from these professors um, that where they cover um, just a wonderful introduction to statistical learning, machine learning in R. Now, here's an example. So, PCA with images. We have 130 examples of handwriting. It is a, they are 16 by 16 grayscale images. So each one of these images are 16 by 16 pixels. There's 256 pixels. And for each one of those pixels, we have a gray intensity on some scale. Now, if I looked at this data set and I asked, what is the dimensionality of this data set? There are 256 pixels in each one of these images, each one of these samples. I could suggest that this is a 256 dimensional data set, that it would require all 256 pixels to describe the variance across this phenomenon. But you would disagree with me. We would all recognize immediately that there are commonalities between the images. Not all possible combinations of grayscale are going on here. And so we should be able to describe this in lower dimensionality. So clearly the images have a high degree of commonality. They're all threes. Can we describe the variability with fewer than 256 features? We can perform just plain Jane regular principal component analysis on this data set, which has 130 samples, 256 features. Okay, let's do that. So the result is a 256 by 256 covariance matrix. We're gonna center the individual features, each one of the pixels, by removing the average of each feature. And we're going to go ahead and we'll get the covariance matrix and then we'll calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. What do we get back? This is fascinating. I love this. Let, let me go ahead and just hide myself for a second. We have principal component scores and we have principal component loadings. Okay, so first of all, let's start out. We've got the first two principal components. We can make estimates using these two principal components. First of all, we've got the average of all of the images. This is the average of all the grayscale across the 130 images. This is the principal component loadings for the first principal component. This is the principal component score number one. Principal component score number two principal component loadings for principal components number two. Now we can explore the variability of these handwritten threes over these two principal components. What are we gonna do? We can go ahead and for each one of these com principal component loadings applied to the original images centered, we can go ahead and calculate the specific principal component scores. Here's principal component score number one, principal component score number two, and we've got all our handwritten examples projected into the space. Now what we can do is we take these examples, we put a mesh down, just an arbitrary mesh. We're just trying to look at the images in this space. 
and then we draw a circle around, identify those that fall closest to each one of the intersections of our mesh, and we will go ahead and look at them right here. Now go ahead and look at them. What is going on with principal component score number one? Well, principal component score number one, this image is this image, this image is this image, and all the way across, and this image is this one, and this one. So if you look at the difference between this image and this image, it's the length of the tail of the three. That's a big contributor to variance in threes that are written by different people. How soon do you pick up the pen? When do you finish the three? Do you keep going or do you truncate very quickly? If you look at this one right here, short, long, short, long. Now, if you look down principal component score number two, and remember, they're orthogonal to each other. So they're describing different components of the variance. This is very powerful. If you look at differences between the images going from here to here, here to here, it's how hard you push with the pen. How dark is your three? How thick are the lines? So this is fascinating. To me, this is just such a great example. Appreciation in the Hasty and All 2009 and their wonderful book, really wonderful book for putting in this example. Now let's do something with the subsurface. Here's an example taken from um, Chopra and all, where they were, go they were using principal component analysis on various different seismic attributes. And so they had six seismic attributes. And what they did was they looked at principal component analysis, looking at these images once again, pixel to pixel. And when they looked at them, they found the first three principal components were able to capture 97% of the variability. Here's the first two principal components. Now, what's interesting, you can look at them and they're seeing different components of the seismic. They were able to use these components. And in fact, what I believe, if I remember the paper, was by removing some of the lower principal components, they were actually removing some of the noise from the seismic image. Okay, so there is a well Python and Jupyter Markdown HTML file available that describes a workflow for principal components, the same workflow with some expansion to what I've shown in the course material. There's also, you can go back to the original workflow. It's located on GitHub. It's in my repository, Python numerical demos with a bunch of subsurface data analytics. This is all, these are all the workflows for this machine learning course. Go ahead and check them out. Try it out. Make some modifications. Use it for yourself. Get started with principal component analysis. Now, here's some examples right here of using principal component analysis and subsurface modeling. Modeling multivariate relationships while avoiding overfitting porosity from a set of seismic attributes. People have been doing this for a long time, in fact. Principal component analysis has been used a lot when it comes to seismic attributes. Image analysis, seismic information, separating multiple attributes into information and noise. That's been done. Analysis of feature grouping, redundancy. That's pretty cool, specifically when we get into unconventionals and we have a lot of different features to work with. It's very valuable to see how they group together. Reducing dimensionality to support simpler modeling workflows. Working in lower dimension is, it's easier. It's much easier to be able to work in these lower dimensions. All right, so this was our lecture on principal component analysis. I hope that this overall discussion, this set of lectures on dimensionality reduction has been useful to you. Once again, I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. It is my pleasure to record all of my lectures and put them online to support my students. And also I hear that there are working professionals who are working through this content, refreshing and gaining new capability to face the digitalization challenge. That's why I do it. I'm here to try to help with that as far as I'm concerned and what I learned from my time in a very good company for 13 years was we win together. We're all in it together. We're all winning together. Now, I'm also the Geostat guy on Twitter. Go ahead and follow me on Twitter for content and only occasional kayaking and hiking pictures. I um, also am Geostat guy lectures on YouTube and I also do GitHub. Geostat guy on GitHub, you can get all of my demonstrations, lots of code. I wrote a package for spatial data analytics geostatistics. It's all available to you on GitHub. All right. I hope this was helpful to you. Hey, thank you very much for watching. Take care, everybody.